We are on Daf Chavtes, three lines down. Oh, my Rav, we'll continue that discussion about the Mitzvah of Yeshiva B'Sukkah. And the question is, after you finish your meal, what do you do with the kalim, the utensils, the cups, and the <laughs> other utensils that you use for food or drinking? <laughs> and Rav goes very far with this. He says, money, money means kalim in Aramaic, Mish, mishtia. Mishtia means for drinking purposes. We watch mishtia. Bimital talasa. You can leave them in your sukkah. And this means that even drinking cups that are made of earthenware can be left in the sukkah. There's no rush to get them out of the sukkah. But money, michla, however, michla means achila. These are utensils that are used for eating and they're made of earthenware. Bar mim tal talasa. Take them out of the sukkah. As soon as you finish eating, get them out of the sukkah. They have a certain repulsive kind of presence in the sukkah. And because we respect the sukkah so much, we don't want to sit around with used kelim. Atzva is also earthenware. In this case, it's a jug. Vishachir. Shachir Rashi identifies as a pail, and it's used for water. Bar mim taltalos. Out of the sukkah. Because it's made of earthenware, it also becomes repel- repulsive. Utraga, uh, a candle or perhaps a kerosene lamp. Now, here we have to refer to a Gemara in Mesetta Shabbos, and that's Mukta. And one of the categories of Mukta is Shraga. Shraga means that after the candle goes out, the oil is full of kind of black stuff. And that's called mukta machmas mius. Mius means it's repulsive. <laughs> However, Rava says, bimetal tolotam. You're allowed to leave the lamp in the sukkah. The amulet, but according to a different tradition, bar mim tal tolotam. It has to be taken out of the sukkah. Hello, please. Gemara reconciles these two traditions in the Shita of Rav with regard to a lamp. Ha besuka gedola, ha besuka ketana. Besuka ketana means a sukkah that has the dimensions, the barest minimum, of seven tfachim by seven tfachim. What difference does it make whether I have a sukkah ketana or a sukkah gedola? So here, the commentaries divide into two camps. According to one camp, which is headed up by the Hagol Sotri, the issue here is a security issue. And if you have a small sukkah, then we're afraid that if you take a lamp into a small sukkah, there's not that much air, there's not that much space, it chas could, could catch on fire. It's like if you go to a hotel, they tell you not to light any fires in, in your room. However, if you have a sukkah gedola, there's plenty of air, there's plenty of space, that's less of a security issue. According to the other school of thought, the issue becomes what's called a clay cheris, meaning that this lamp is made from earthenware. And as a result of its earthenware, it absorbs the oil that you use in the lamp and it becomes disgusting, it becomes repulsive. However, if you have a sukkah gedola, a larger sukkah, then nobody has to look at the lamp. You know, you put it on the side and it's not noticeable. Had it been a sukkah ketana, it's very high, hard to hide your lamp in such a small sukkah. And therefore, rubber rules, according to the second tradition, that you have to get it out of your sukkah. It's repulsive. And basically, on both side, we'd have to go through all the post skim to work out all the details. But the underlying principle here is that which you don't want to sit around in the presence of those objects. Those should be taken out of the sukkah. Now we get to the Mishnah. And you recall that the Mishnah spoke about Yardu Gishavim, when rains fall in. 
And the mission established that if the drops of rain fall into your tavshil, whatever you're eating, and they ruin the tavshil, then it's time to take your meal into the house. How do we learn in a brisa? Which means the following, that even if the rain comes down to a porridge of beans, of grisim, which is, by the way, a word that's used even in modern Hebrew, then barley. eat barley. barley or beans, then what happens is these kinds of porridges will ruin very, very quickly. And this brisa is giving us a kula, a leniency, that you're already allowed to leave the sukkah and it's sufficient amount of rain that this kind of a porridge, which would get ruined very quickly, you're allowed to leave the sukkah. And the Gemara tells us the following story. Abaye have a kayasiv kamid rav yosif Now, as an introduction to this sugya, keep in mind that we learned the sugya yesterday about a foul odor. And no one was really uh, sensitive to that odor except for one of the Amoraim. And he said that for me, I'm in a state of mitztayer. I'm uncomfortable with the sukkah. If it was my house, I would leave my house. In light of that introduction, we understand that Abai was sitting in front of Rabbi Yosef in the sukkah. Nashav Zika, a wind came along, the Kamaisi Tsivusa. The schach was made of wood, and as a result of the blowing of the wind, splinters of wood fell into the sukkah. Amaluhu, Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef said to the Talmidim in the sukkah, Panuli, clear out my utensils, money, my utensils, mehocha from the sukkah, I'm going to eat in the house. Amaluhu, Abai, Abai says, but what are you going to do with the Mishnah? Misha Tisrach mikvah. Only when the porridge gets ruined, and in this case, although these splinters of wood are falling down from the schach, it's not going to ruin your porridge. Amale, Rav Yossi says, Lididi. But for me, this is impossible. Why? I can't tolerate Kevin to Anina Date. Anina Date, which is otherwise known as an istinus. I don't know if you're familiar with that word. It's probably a Greek word. It's a person who's super sensitive. And Rav Yosef cla classifies himself as super sensitive. Honestly, I I'm suspicious, but it's probably not true what I'm about to tell you, that this story took place after Rav Yosef went blind. Rav Yosef was blind. And it could be that for a blind person, you know, you got splinters floating around, he runs away as a natural fear. He doesn't realize that it's okay and the splinters are not going to ruin anything. But the main point here in this sugya, as we saw yesterday in the case of a smell, is that if for you personally, it's impossible for you to tolerate this sukha because of your super sensitivities, then for you it's a mitzvah. And the sukha is causing you undue discomfiture. You're allowed to leave the sukha. The Talmidim would go with their Rebbe, they would accompany him. It's not crystal clear whether they ate with him in the house because they could have eaten in the sukkah, they were able to, to tolerate these splinters coming down from the top. Now the rain start falling. The yarad, and he left the sukkah. The reason for the word yarad is in those days, it was common to have the sukkah up on the roof. So he goes into his house. And now the Gemara wants to know, quoting this price, at what point does he have to see, well, the rain stopped, now he's got to terminate mid-meal from the house and go back into the sukkah. Once he began his su'uda in the middle, it stopped raining. And now he's eating in his house. And the question is, you know, he gets the call from his children. Dad, it stopped raining. And the law is that let him finish his meal. Why? Because it would be a tircha for him to stop his meal, mid-meal, pack out, remove all of the kalim, and bring them back into the sukkah. And therefore, we're going to let him eat, complete, excuse me, his meal in the house. Now here, I have a flood of questions to ask. Unfortunately, it's a dafyomichir, and we don't have time to address them. 
Question number one, does this halach apply in the first night of Sukkot? Because if you recall, yesterday we discussed that the first night of Sukkot has a separate chiv derived from the Kisari Shabbat 2-2 that you have to eat your meal in the Sukkot. So it could be that these kinds of leniencies that allow you to eat your meal in the house would not apply to the first night. Question number two, we don't have a clear definition. What level of tircha of discomfiture is enough to exempt you from a sukkah? Like, for example, I discussed with you the other day, what happens if my neighbor has a sukkah? And I don't have a sukkah, but it's a mile away. Am I obligated to sit in his sukkah? He's inviting me to come to his sukkah, but it's a great tircha for me. This whole area of halacha is very unclear. And at the end of the day, you're going to have to ask yourself a personal question. Would I leave my house in such a situation? It's very, very subjective. But he's sleeping under the schach of the sukkah. The rain started coming back. He already went into his house. And my trichino solalos, we don't require him to go back into the sukkah. Ad, what's the next word? Sheye or. Now, does your Gemara have an aleph or an ayin? Oh. An aleph. Well, I have a secret for you. It's not at all clear whether it should be an aleph there or an ayin. The word is pronounced exactly the same way, but it means two different things. Sheye or means that it was after daybreak. And with daybreak, he's going to have to go back into his sukkah if it's not raining, obviously. But if you read it with an ayin, Sheyar, Yeyar means he wakes up. He went to sleep and it was raining out. The sukkah is drenched. But at some point he wakes up. It could be he wakes up in the middle of the night. His children might wake up in the middle of the night and say, Dad, let's go back into the sukkah. But he's sleeping in his bed. He woke up. Does he have to go back into the sukkah? So the Gemara says, Ibailahu. We have two different traditions, and we're not sure. Should we read it ad sheyeyar until he wakes up? Milashon lehit orer with an ayin, or ad sheyeyar with an aleph until daybreak. And if you take a look at Rashi, o ad sheyeyar, which is about twenty lines down from the top, I don't know if that helps anybody. Ad sheyeyar mishnei shinaso until he wakes up. But in the he kids, if you have it sheyer with an onion, if he wakes up, afilu bechatsi alayla. Rashi says in the middle of the night, yakum bishe naso the yala the yisham besuk. We're not going to wake him up, but if he wakes up, I'm for tikkun katzos. But some say that we don't say tikkun katzos on sukkah. Anyway, so he's got to go back into the sukkah. If you hold ad sheyer, bashma. Let's derive a conclusion on this issue from a Bryce. The Bryce says, Clearly the Bryce has an Aleph. And I'll prove it to you because it says, which means the first light of dawn. But everything depends upon daybreak, which means that according to the Gemara, it would seem that Tarte, Tarte means the Brisa is giving two different times because it starts with the word Yeyar and then it goes on to Yala Munachaka. The truth is, those are two different times because when you're talking about Yeyar, Yeyar means that there's a light of sun on the eastern horizon. So if you look towards your east, you'll see a patch of, of red, of light. But the phrase, Yala Buddha Shachar, that's an early period of time. That's what we call dawn. That's even earlier than Yeyer. So the Gemara answers, Ela Ema Achi Yeyer the Yala Buddha Shachar. And now what the Gemara is doing is, in order to reconcile the inherent contradiction in this price between Yeyer and Yala Murashach, I think Mark changes the word Yeyar from an Aleph to an Ayin. And the Brysa reads the following Until he awakens, and Yala Amurashach. 
Oh, just just give me one second. I'm sorry. I just I, I don't want to lose my trend. The Bryce is saying that Lakula, I think that's what you meant, Mendel, but I just wanted to work it out in my brain. That it's got to be Yeor and Yala Buddha Chakra. It's not enough that he's awake. Because he might have woken up in the middle of the night, but it's also Yala Murasha. We don't have to wait till sunrise when the entire eastern uh, horizon is, you know, has um, has been lit up. That we don't have to wait for. But once it's Amura Shaka, Yala Murashaka, and he's awake. So if he's still sleeping, we don't have to wake him up to go into the sukkah and sleep in the sukkah. But even if he wakes up, we don't have to force him to pack his bags and with his pajamas, you know, move into the sukkah to sleep. We wait till Achiyale Amud Hashach. Okay, then? So that's the final Maskana Lakula. If he's still sleeping, we don't wake him up. Even if he wakes up, if it's before Yale Amud Hashachar, he does not have to go back into the sukkah. Mishnah adds a mushal. If it rains in the sukkah to the point to which he has to leave the sukkah, it's like the case of a servant who's pouring water to, uh, to um, what was the word, to, to de, deconcentrate, what's the word, to dilute, to dilute the concentrated wine, and his master doesn't allow him to continue the process, but rather somehow the water gets spilled into his face, so to speak. Ibailu, what does this mean? Mishafak Lami. Is it that the master is spilling the water in the face of the servant? That's the way we understood it. But the Gemara is now raising another possibility. That maybe by mistake, not deliberately, the servant actually spilled the picture, the picture on his master. You know, we, we very often, I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you're sitting in a restaurant. And the waiter pours something on top of him. Not, not deliberately, hopefully. Ashma <laughs> Desanya, we have an explicit price that says, Shavaklo Rabo Kiton Alpanov. It means clearly that it's the master who spills the pitcher of water onto the face of the Evan, the Amar Lo. And he's basically telling him, I'm not interested in your service, in your serving. That's what Akash Baruch Hu is saying to us when it rains. I, I don't think this would apply in Canada. It's always raining in Canada. Only Manchester, many other places on the face of it. Oh. So, yeah. Rabbanu, we learned in Hebrides. So now, from now on, Rabosai, until I tell you otherwise, I'm not accepting any questions. I, I, I apologize. I'm just running through this, I would have normally skipped it, but because of my respect for Rav Shapiro, <laughs> I'm not skipping it. This is all about signs from eclipses of the sun. So if you want to learn it, please, I absolutely will tell you, go home to your homework and spend an hour on this, Gimar, if not 10 hours. Tana Rabbanu, we went to the Bryce. Bizman Shachama Loka. When literally the sun was hit and the light of the sun is diminished, and this is what's called a solar eclipse. Timon Ra, it's a bad omen, Lechol Ha'olam Kulu, meaning the sun and its light is indicative of the Chesed of Hashem. And here we have Midas Hadid, Masha Leman Dov Redome, Lemelech Basar Medom, Sha'asa Su'ud Alavadot. The, the uh, king prepared a beautiful banquet for his servants. V'iniach Panos Lufneem, it was at night. So there was a, a source of light, a Panas, of uh, some sort of a torch and Kasalin. For some reason, they misbehaved. He was not satisfied with them. The Omali Avdo, and he told his servant, Tol Panas Mipneim, take away the lantern. O Shiva Bechoshech, let him live in darkness. And when there's a solar eclipse and the sunlight is diminished, the world is in darkness. That's a Simon Minashamayim, that the world is in darkness. So those who like to see, a solar eclipse would not want to know about this Gemara. Just don't tell them that. Tanya, we learned to the price of Rabbi Meir Omen. Kol's manche ma'oros lokin. Ma'oros, we know, are the luminaries up in the heavens. And if they're stricken, you should know, says Rabbi Meir, 
in such a case, the the Soneim Shal Yisrael are facing a Simon Ra. Now, when you see the word Soneim Shal Yisrael, that's a euphemism for the Jewish people. That's what we call Lashem Sagim. And oh, how does Rabbi Meir know? So name doesn't mean Jew, means Jew, it means boy. It means Jew. That's called a euphemism. You know that word euphemism? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I only know it because of the Gemara that I learned. Or <laughs> well, maybe because when I prepare for my uh, algebra. I don't know. Anyway, a euphemism. That's called Lushen Sagi No. Now, why is this a bad sign for the Jews? According to Rabbi Meir, they're used to getting hit by Hashem. The Jews are in Golis. They're being punished for their sins. And they're going to be first to be punished. Marshall, and I'll prove it to you from the following simile. Sofer Shebola Beis HaSefer. Now the word Sofer, which sometimes means a scribe, but in this context, it means a Melamed. What we call a Melamed Tinochus is called a Sofer. For that, you have to learn a Gemara Bav Basra. In any event, so he comes into the schoolroom, into the class, and he's holding on to his, his you know, Shmeitzim, you know, he's going to give Pach. He's holding on to a Ritzua, to a strap. Me doy, who should be nervous about him? He should rug your little coast to Choyom Bayom. Who doy, the person who misbehaves on a regular basis and he gets hit as a punishment, he's the one who has to be very nervous. And basically, the nimshal is that Klal Yisrael, unfortunately, are more than any other people on the face of the globe, are constantly suffering from onshim during gulps. And therefore, if the eclipse means that God is holding on to the strap, Klal Yisrael better be very careful. Now, honestly, I don't understand this Gemara, but as I told you, I'm not able to answer any questions. I can just ask questions. I can't answer them. The Gemara says in the Seth the Chavis, Ain Mazel be Israel, that the Jewish nation are above the Mazels. Rabbi Meir seems to assume, and everything that we're going to learn today in the Agadah until we get to the Mishnah seems to assume that we can see what's going to happen to the Jewish people based on what we look at in the sky, in the Mazels. And again, maybe the Gemara would be Machalic between Mazels, which are stars in the zodiac and the sun and the moon. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But that, that to me is a very bothersome question. No one that I saw asks this question. Honor we learned in a Brisa. Bizman Shacham Loke. Beautiful. The Brisa says that there are two kinds of eclipses. There's a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse. And each eclipse is addressing a different part of the globe, a different segment of the nations of the world. Why? The sun is representative of the nations of the world. The moon is representative of Klal Yisrael. If you're talking about a solar eclipse, Simon Rala of the And by the way, of the in this context means all the Goyim on the face of the earth. Levana Loka, if you're talking about a lunar eclipse, Simon Rala Sonem Shal Yisrael. That's a bad omen for the Jewish people. The way that the calendar works is that the Goyim use the solar calendar, the Jews use the lunar calendar. And what happens in a case of a solar eclipse? Lokim in Mizrah, sometimes as the sun is rising, you will see the eclipse. So that's in the east. That's a bad sign for those who live on the east, the eastern people. But the Marav, if the eclipse is on the western side of the horizon towards the sunset, in the afternoon, etc., during the evening, that's a bad sign for the west. What happens if the eclipse is right there in the middle of the sky, in the zenith of the sunlight? That's a bad sign for the entire world because it doesn't lean in any direction. Everyone in the face of the globe sees the eclipse, and that's a message to all of them. Then the Gemara talks about different complexions of the sun. Hanav domim ledam. Sometimes the sun is 
almost reddish in its color, like you'll see it very often here in Eretz Yisrael, mm-hmm. is that's Cherev Boliolim. That's a simon of Shvichas Domin, that is going to be battle and war and so on in the world. Lissak. But if, on the other hand, it's like a sackcloth, which is dark in color, then it's a simon raf or something else. Chitei ra'av boim li'olam. It means arrows of hunger. It means when a person is undernourished, <coughs> their complexion turns dark. And Chazal very often speak about the time of the Churban, when the Jewish people were suffering tremendously from hunger. Lazu v'lazu, sometimes the sun looks dark and it's also red. Then that's a terrible sun. It's a bad omen for both destruction and for hunger. Here is Machlokas, what Knisaso means, but we'll go according to Rashi. Knisaso means at sunset, Puranus Shoalovo. It's at the end of the day, so we have to wait to see the Onish. It's going to take place later on. It's delayed. Be it see also, but when the sun comes out onto the horizon, with daybreak, my hair is level. You should know that the punishment, the retribution to people is going to happen immediately. And others have it the exact opposite that when the eclipse occurs at sunset, then the retribution will arrive swiftly. Just the sun is immediately going to set, the retribution, the Onesh will come forth immediately. If on the other hand, the eclipse occurs at sunrise, the retribution will be delayed in arriving, just like the sun remains all day on the horizon before setting towards evening. When God meets out punishment to the people of any particular nation, it's impossible that its guardian angels, every nation in the world has a guardian angel up in Shomayim. They too, the angels themselves, will be punished. And this touches on a very deep philosophical question, which I never understood, whether angels have Bechir and they should be punished. It seems from the Nusach of Mitzan Tokev, of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, that even the angels in heaven are punished. And this Gemara would support. Remember that in Mitzan Tokev, HaMalachim, Echavezun, Bechir Achaz, Yom Yom Hadin. The Nemar, the Gemara quotes the Post in Yishayo, in Yerbiyo, excuse me, I'll meet out punishment to the gods of Egypt. These gods of Egypt are the celestial protectors up in Shomayim of these nations, in this case of Mitzrayim. And this is perhaps what the Gemara means at the end of Shabbos. This next line in the Gemara might answer my question before. The Gemara says in Shabbos, Ain Mazel be Yisrael. Why? Because Yisrael osin mitzon shal makom ain misyara mikolim. All these bad signs of which my don't pay any attention. The Jewish people are doing the right thing. Those are omens for the nations of the world, not for you. Shenemar osin yirmiyo, and it says ko amar Hashem el derech agoyim al tul tul madu me oso sashmaim al tachet teichatu. Don't be afraid of the signs in the heavens. Let the Goyim be frightened by them, but not the Jewish people. The Goyim have to be afraid of these signs, but not the Jews, because the Jews are worthy, and none of these calamities will befall the Jewish people. They're osim, return children. On Rabbanon, now the rest of the Sagadat until the Mishnah is going to deal with different kinds of bad things that happen and what causes those bad things to happen. There are four kinds of sins that will bring about a solar eclipse, which as we said before, is an ad omen. Number one, if the head of the courts Dies and no one eulogized him properly. Number two, Al Nara Murasa Shitsaka Beirvi Moshiala. When a girl never was raped and she's crying out for help and no one saves her. 
like, you know, classic, they talk about the trains, you know, in America and England, different places in Europe. And somebody comes on to mug somebody and everybody all of a sudden is reading their newspaper very carefully. Yeah, happened to you. Happened to you. It's homosexuality. I don't know what this is all about. I mean, murder is a terrible crime. Are we talking about a case where two brothers were murdered? I don't know. And there are four kinds of uh, 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 averos which will cause a, an eclipse of the ma'oros. It seems that at this point, the Gemara is talking about not the sun, and a solar eclipse, but other luminaries other than the sun, maybe the moon, maybe a stars. Mm -hmm. What are these four Averos? Al Kosve Plaster, which literally means documents. And apparently they're forged or false documents. And Rashi, where's the Rashi? If I find it quickly, Rashi identifies this. Here it is, four lines up from the bottom. Shtaros mizuyafim umichtave amal lishlosum dofi al adam lifto bishmo mashalot tziva. So they they write down a document, and and the document contains some sort of message that so and so is obligated to pay, and the whole thing is just a bluff. And Rashi probably gives that shot. In order to contrast that category with the next category, me they aid to check that those who give false testimony. Because if they saw in the document that Ruven owes Shimon money and the whole thing was false, then that comes under aid to check it. That's false testimony. So why would the Bryce are listed as two different Averas? So that's why Rashi comes up with this whole theory that Kosve Plaster means that they imagined, you know, they forged a document that so-and-so said he would pay so-and-so. This is a sugya in Baba Kama. I'm not sure if this takana still is applicable today in our time, but the Gemara says you're not allowed to raise young, uh, small small animals like you know sheep and goats and things like that in Eretz Yisrael because it's impossible to protect them from grazing in another field. Yeah. So this has to do with the Sugi Babakama of Kedushas Eretz Yisrael. Now, finally, I'll quote say Lamas Tovos. If a person cuts down a fruit-bearing tree, he violates a law in the Torah, and the Torah was very careful, very harsh about punishing for that violation because the fruit tree is representative of God's creation. The fact that this tree has the capacity to produce fruit. David, are you with me? I can't tell whether he's here or not here. Okay. David, can you open your can you open your camera, David? Now we have a different punishment. And the property of Jewish homeowners is being confiscated by the Goyish authority. What caused it? What were the Various sins. Number one, al mashe shtaras pruit. The law is that if the malva collects his loan, he's not allowed to hold on to the shtar. He's got to rip it up or give it back to the loaf. Because the chazal made a takon, if he leaves it in his possession, he might come to believe mistakenly that he was never paid up. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to come back and once again demand pay al malve ribis. And we know that there's a violation of ribis, a number of different lavin, when you take interest and use it. Well, we're now on Davchav Tes Amit Beis. And we're listing four violations. We're up to the third. Al Shehoya Sipek Biyodam Limchos for all the Averis that we mentioned before, in the case of someone who is very influential, he's a member of the, the parliament or he's 
a rich person and people take him very seriously and he didn't protest. And this we see over and over again throughout Chazal, that if you let things go by in silence without protesting, you are held responsible for those averos. <clears throat> and finally, number four, Al Shaposkim stuck of Arab made him know some. How often do we have a major comp- campaign? People pledge and they don't live up to that pledge. My, my friend, Rabbi Mayor May, is a fundraiser for the Simon Wiesenthal Center in LA. And he tells me he's got, he got his first lesson. They, they raised tons of money. From Rav Salvechik, he said that when Yeshiva University was going through very difficult financial situations, Dr. Lamb was the president. He asked Rabbi Salvechik if he would come to a fundraiser. Rabbi Salvechik was not a fundraiser. But in this case, he capitulated because the Yeshiva was in bad straits and he came in, 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 in a house in the West Side and all the brass with it. I can mention the names of the, the big brass there, the rich people. And the Rav gave a pitch and he said, what, you know, how uh, Yeshiva University, what it's done, blah, blah, blah. And they raised a million dollars. So Rev, my friend Rabbi May, Mayor, was driving the Rav back to uh, the Heights. And after he got into the car, he said to the Rav, that was great. The Rav said two words, old pledges. And Rabbi May said, that was my first lesson in fundraising, old pledges. Meaning these were pledges that they had not yet paid up for. There were no new fundraising. (laughs) They take and destroy the property of homeowners for four violations. Number one, I'll coach a sockier. If they don't pay the laborers, the al oshke schar Now, what's the difference? Oshke schar sofir is also someone who doesn't pay his laborers. But in the first case, it's kovshe. Kovshe means they delay payment. In other words, you're supposed to get your salary at the first of the month, and they delay it. In the second case, it seems that they still the payment of the laborers. Again, if, if you have that case, which is Rashi, then I don't understand why you need the first case. I'll put, I'll park in all those who have responsibility in the community, and instead of fulfilling and living up to their responsibility, they pass the buck. So common. Next, I'll gasses grew up and, and arrogance and conceit. And as a result, people are wealthy, you know, they take advantage of, as we saw before, the laborers, and they don't want to live up to their personal responsibility in the community, and they get all bloated and full of themselves. Gases are real connected cool, and the worst sin of them all is gases, is arrogance. HaKadosh Baruch can't tolerate arrogance. Aniva hu enam darim b'kfifakas, if you're familiar with that statement. Avol anovim, be anovim on the humble people, milosh anov. On that, the Pesach says, in Tehillim, David Amel says, V'anovim Yishu Eretz, they shall inherit the land. This angu alrov shalom. And they will find delight in the abundance of peace. Hadron Alecha, Perak Yochanan. And now we start Perak Lulav HaGozim. So we have now 20 minutes to start Perak Lulav HaGozim. We'll see what we can do in 20 minutes. I can't promise you any magical tricks? I don't have. Uh, I don't have anything. Uh, rapid to... The Torah says, "Olakachem lachem bayomarishon pre eats hadar kapos tamarim anaf eats avos viarei nochal who smachtem with neishem al kechem shivas yom." So we have four minim that are mentioned in generic terms, not in specific terms, in Parshas Em. And our mission is going to focus on one of those four, which is called Kapos Tamarim, which we identify as a Lulav. And we're going to see that this Gemara goes into great detail about how the Lulav grows. And it's basically a branch of a decal tree, of a palm, palm tree. And when it goes out of the base of the decal, it looks like an arrow 
that is being held inside some sort of covering. And as it grows, the various parts or leaves start separating a little bit. And with its growth, it adds more and more leaves. If you leave it too long on the tree, then it starts shrinking. And it gets hard like a, like a piece of wood. And when the Torah says kapos tmarin, that means it's in its very immature state when it's still moist and it shoots out of the main base of the decal tree, of the date palm tree. And it's still connected and it looks like an arrow. The leaves have not separated one from the other. And the Gemara is going to derive this from Sukim. Kapos means kafus. It's tied together. Lulav HaGazel, the Mishnah says, that if you steal a lulav or a vayavesh or a dried up lulav, in both cases, possible. Rashi says, Okay, so these are two separate cases. Very quickly, Rabos. Why is a lulav a Yavesh puzzle. In the case of Gazel, the Torah says, Lukachtem Lachem. It's got to be yours. And the Gemara is going to analyze does that requirement apply the whole seven days or only on the first day? But as far as Yavesh is concerned, what's the nature of the Psul? Rashi, if you see three lines down, from second, where's the Rashi? Four lines down from the top. Rashi says, the Be'inon. Mitzvah mehuderes. And I'll add a few words to Rashi. Zekeli v'anvehu. And Tosa says that's impossible. Tosa said, Lo kamo shapirish ha-kuntras. Mishum d'ksiv zekeli v'anvehu. Tien v'anvehu l'chatchila. And you get yourself a beautiful esrog, a beautiful luav. A beautiful Ner Hanukkah, a beautiful Talis, a beautiful Sefer Torah, but that's only Lukat Chila. How could Rashi quote the Post Zekeli? Very, very difficult Rashi. Tosa says that we derive this Psul of Yavesh from a Hekesh to Esrog, because since both Esrog and Lulav are mentioned in the same Post, the Esrog is described as pre eights. Adar, so the Lulav also, and for that matter, the Arabas and Dandasim also require Adar. Adar means beautiful, and if it's dried up to a certain point, we'll see exactly at what point, it's no longer hot. That's Tosu Sushi. The Rashi inflects the Pasuk of Zekeli, the Anvil. Shall Irani Dachas Post. So this has to do with the Shita of Rabbi Shimon. Which is called Kala Omedli Sarev Kisarovdom. Anything that has to be burnt, according to Jewish law, is considered already a fit to burnt. It doesn't have the shear. It doesn't have a. And we're going to see in this Mishnah that there's a shear of free talking for a lulav. There's no shear of a lulav in the case of Irani Dachas, because in Irani Dachas, the Torah requires if most of the members of a city worship the Hodazara, the Torah says that we have to burn all of the possessions all of the objects in that city, including a lula. However, there's something called Shel Asherah. What is an Asherah? Rashi says, Elon Sha'ovdin also Avodazor. It's a kind of a tree that was worshipped as an idol. And once again, with regard to Asherah, the Torah says, we're going to read it this Shabbos, Vashereyam, Tisifun va'es va'esh. You have to burn the asherah. And again, the Gemara is going to analyze what kind of an asherah was. Was it worshipped by a Jew, by a guy? Is there such a thing a bittel? Can you change the, you know, the lulav, make it a little dent in it, and all this kinds of stuff? And with regard to irani dachas, the Torah says, "Es kol shlalot tikvotz el toch roch rechova v'sarafta be'eshes ha'ir v'es kol shlalot." We have to burn 
the city, meaning all the objects in the city. And since it's a shear in Lulav, our Mishnah speaks about three talking, but it's really four talking, we'll see. In any event, Omeid li saref kis saref dom. And therefore there's no shear. Okay, that is the easy part of the Mishnah. I'll get to the more complicated part. Of the and trust me, Rabos, I'm very scared of it because I remember when I learned this many, many years ago, it even, it was incredibly complicated. So to learn it with Daf Yogi. So the first category, now we're up to psulim that are not legal psulim, but rather are physical. Something got damaged in the lul. The first case is niktam rocha, which we translate as nechtach. There was a cut of roshe rov ha'olim helyon. So the lulav is going to be divided up into parts. Right now, two parts, maybe later three parts, but and the elyon, the top part of the lulav, has X number of, of leaves. And 51% of that number were nechta, were cut off. And therefore, since rov olim elyonim nechtichu, the Mishnah is going to invalidate that lulav. Just, you know, use it as a... Uh, you know, to sweep the floors. It's not going to help you for the mix. Case number two. Nifritsu Olaf. Okay, now, we're no longer talking about the Olim HaElyonim, all the top, whatever you, let's say this is the Lulav, that's the top part of the Lulav, and we count up the Olim, and we come to a number, and we have 51%, and it was cut. No. Now, we're talking about the Shidra. If you want, I can show you a picture of the Shidra here. Here's the Shidra. And above the Shidra, which literally the Shidra translates as the spine, are the Olim Ha'el Yon. So now we're down to the Shidra. And we're talking about Nifritsu Olaf. Okay, there are X number of olim that make up the shidra. Right, the shidra is red, and it's got a number of olim. And once again, nifritsu. Now, nifritsu doesn't mean they cut it because they didn't cut the shidra, but they they ripped out some of the olim. Not a very smart thing to do. How many of the olive of the shidra did they remove? remove? Rov. They took out rov. So niktav rosho and nifritsu olive are really two ways of saying the same thing. I mean, they're two different scenarios and two different realities. But both cases, you removed rov olive. In the first case, you cut rov olive from the elyona, the top part of the love. And in the second case, you ripped out most of the olive from the Shidra. Now the Kiddush of the Mishnah Apostle means that it's irreversible. There's nothing you could do to salvage and kasher up this lula. Now, in the case of Nikam Rocho, that's obvious. There's nothing I can do. But in the case of Nifritsu, what could have happened was that the olive could be tied together. They're not totally gone. Possible. Nevertheless, even if you were to tie it together, it still remains possible. Morris is Nifridu. Oh, that, that's the next part of the I'm up to that. Oh. Nifridu, all of. Now we get to case number three. Oh, okay. Okay, then? So Nifridu, all of means that it's not a case of Nifrat, where you know you ripped out those olives. But rather, with the course of time, they separated, they split. Have you ever seen a lulav, you know, where the leaves of the lulav are sort of spread out in this direction and that direction? Yeah? David, if, you, if you've seen it, shake, shake your head. Okay. 
Oh, sure. Now here we have machlokas between the Tanakama and Rabbi Yehuda. The Tanakama first says that since these leaves are still attached, again, they've been spread apart. You no longer have the coffers that we spoke about before. But nevertheless, they're still attached. We're going to let you use that loop. The Torah sees that as a valid loop. But Rabbi Yehuda told me, no, 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 no. Yegdenu milamal. It will only be kosher if you tie together the olim of the shidra, those leaves that come out of the spine of the lulav. Without tying them together, awesome. So whereas the Tanakhama has an absolute validation, Rabbi Yehuda makes a contingent. Sine, the word sine are palm trees. Harabarza. They grow on mountains. Normally, you'll find lulavim and palm trees on flat plain. But there are palm trees that grow up in the mountains. And what's strange about them in terms of Hilfus Lulav is they don't grow properly the way a normal lulav will grow. How so? so? I'm going to read to you the summary of Rashi. Alem mu'atim, they have very few leaves, and those leaves that they have, ktanim mi'od, are very small, and number three, meruchakim zev mizev. Have you ever seen it? The reason why you don't see it is because it's possible, so you won't find it out in the marketplace, but I've seen them. They, they look like this. They have, you know, small leaves, and then you go up a little bit, another and another and another. Have you ever, I'm sure you've seen it. In, in any event, uh, I'll bring in Blinetta if I remember a picture. Mars here, by the way, will be on Zoom. So it's the Dafyomi on my email, and then you add 613. Okay. So what's the deal with these kinds of lulav? And here we have an entire issue because the Mishnah says that Kshiros, that you could use these lulavim and they are Kshiros. Now, in the note that I have over here, he writes, Sine Harabarzel, heim to call him Akdelim Begay Ben Hinnon, right outside of Jerusalem. Shehu Am Amek, it's down in the valley. And the Mishnah, Calls it Hara Barza. Very strange. You know, are these love are growing in a, in, a, in a valley or up on the mountain. The Loman Atmar Magdalen with the Kalim Chebaharim is how your Makam Lomish Afla Mitzvah's love ain't had the Kalim Ruuyim. A Mashmal in the Mishnah says that ain't lift so the Kaf to call him a Lukal's man shall rush shall Ola Magiela Ikro shall Ola me out. The top of this leaf, very small leaf, reaches the bottom of the other leaf. We're going to have this in Adasi. But I would never think it would apply to love him. But the case of Tzini Abarza, where the leaves are very short, and the Mishnah says the Lulav is kosher, that's because the Mishnah is envisioning a case where one leaf overlaps with the bottom of the next leaf, the top leaf on top. What is the shear of a Lulav? Lulav, Sheyeshbo, Shloshet Tfachim, Kedelin Aneabo Kosher. We know. That there's a mitzvah called Nanuim. And with regard to the shear of a lulav, we need the amount that is necessary for Nanuim. Nanuim means to shake the lulav in four directions and also Shamayim for arts. 
And Rashi says this is Kedei Latsa Ruchos Rose Utlolim Roy. Okay. So when he takes the Lulav, he has to do Nanuim in the Lulav. And here we have Machlokis, whether or not this is Doraisa or Dirabono. The impression you get from that Mishnah is that it's Doraisa. And the Lulav has to be taller than the Adasim and the Arabos. It's the Min Kavosh. So the Lulav has to be the tallest of the other two Minim. And the Gemara is going to go into long discussion here about how many tfachim the lulav has to be. What impression did you get from the mission? Three. Not so. That's the impression I got too, so we're in good company. But you read it like this. Shlosha tfachim u Again, you don't see that vav, but that's the way the Gemara is going to interpret it. So you need three tfachim, which is the size of the Hadassim and the Arabos. And then with regard to the Luav, I need a fourth Tefah so that the Luav be tall enough for Nanuim. The Gemara says, Kaposik Vitani, the Mishnah doesn't make any qualifications. It just simply says, flat, unqualified, that a Luav HaGazel and a Luav HaYavish is possible. Implying the whole seven days. Lo shna v'yontav rishon, lo shna v'yontav sheni. Yontav sheni here means the other days of sukkah. Bishleim, I understand, yavesh, hadar v'inon v'leka. Tosa says this is the hekesh between lulav and esro. And that hekesh defines the nature and the essence of a lulav. And if it's not hadar, it's not a lulav. And therefore you can't use it for any day of sukkah. I don't get it. The Torah says, I'll read all the etc., etc. Is lachem means me shalachem. And gazel is not yours. But the rest, the balance of the days, which is a rabbinic requirement, zechel of migdash. Because in the base of Migdash, the Torah required Smachlub saying, Shem Lekech Shivas Yamin, is a my low? Why can't he fulfill the mitzvah of Lulav even if he doesn't own the Lulav? So, for example, let's say on the second day of, of, of Sukkot here in Eretz Yisrael, I would give my Lulav to a katan before I, I take it myself. The katan can't give it back to me. It can still be Yotzeh the mitzvah. There's no din of Lachem on the second day of Sukkot. I didn't steal it from him. So why does the Mishnah made it make an outright, flat, unqualified statement that a lulav hagazel is possible all seven days of the Chag? On Rabbi Yochai Mishum, Rabbi Shimba Yochai, Shum da Havile Mitzvah Ba Bavera. Because the only way he was able to get access to this lulav is by stealing it. He didn't have a lulav of his own. And therefore, it's a mitzvah above Avera. The Avera sets up the mitzvah. The lulav is gazel. And that's a psul that applies both to lulav to rice on the first day and to lulav de Rabbanon, which is a takon of Rabbi Yochum and Zakai for the balance of Chag Hasukas. And now, what we're going to learn in Mirz Shem tomorrow, Belin is how do we know that the halacha disqualifies a mitzvah from whence do we derive that conclusion? Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see each other tomorrow on Zoom.